Hi, welcome back to the Manufacturing Come Up. I'm your host, Malachi Greb. Today, we have a special guest. You may already know him, Ira Sharp. How's it going? Yeah, it's going great, Malachi. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. You're you're a vet in the industry. You've had a, a heck of a career run. Was like over 17 years with Phoenix Contact. Yeah, it's it's been it's been a long run. I like to say that I started when I was seven, and uh, that's how I have 17 years now. It's not quite that bad. <laughs> but yes, I've been with Phoenix Contact for a little over 17 years. It's been a fantastic run for sure. That's awesome. I guess to start off. I'll, First question is, what do you think uh, elicited you you being able to stay with one company your entire career? Well, so, uh, you know, a big, big reason I've stayed with Phoenix Contact is, um, you know, really, as you if you look at it. So um, Phoenix Contact, it's a great company. Um, it's right in my local area here where I basically grew up. Um, it's, uh, it's where I met my now wife then girlfriend. So I really wanted to stay in this particular area. And, uh, so that's how I, I found the company. But then once I was there, uh, Phoenix contact is, is kind of an odd company. I'd like to say in a good way, in the sense of it's, uh, it's, it's a big enough company to allow things, allow you to do things and explore and kind of, uh, be a little bit more entrepreneurial. Um, but not so small that they can't make things happen. So they're in this nice uh, in-between space. It's a privately held company. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have to make sure we're profitable. We have to do all these different things, but it's it's not just trying to make the shareholders happy and these kind of things. So it's it's been great to work for a company that has been able to provide me the latitude to be able to explore mm -hmm. and do different things. And, uh, and, and there's been lots of jumping points because I haven't had the same position over the past 17 years. I've been a specialist, I've been manager, and now I'm a director. Um, so it's really given me a lot of latitude to try new things and manage teams and explore. So it's, 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 been, it's been good. It's been good. Yeah. I always feel like it's really, really good to like just be able to experience a lot of things throughout a company. And, I, and also, too, I think Phoenix Contact is like a really good company because the, to me – they provide a high quality product at a, at a much lower cost. And, and also too, I think they, I feel like they've been pretty innovative in like, like some of like the spring loaded terminal blocks, like the triple stack, like this, the, uh, what do you guys have? You have the electronic circuit breakers. I love those. Like, so you have like a lot just of keep like, going, just keep going. Yeah. That's good. Just keep going. <laughs> Everything you love is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so that is, y'all have that, the PLC V8 or is i think that's what it's called right mm -hmm. but uh that's that's a good little system to, like throw on on small pieces of equipment like there's like a lot of times if we just need a couple relays in the system we'll just throw one of those on there just, just because even if we just really just only need relays because it's yeah. not that much more expensive to to you know add a little brain onto it and, and now you have relays and you have a little bit of brain if you want to do some modified, yeah. modified control of it yeah, you, yeah, you're talking about the little logic module you add on, and you can do yeah. a little logic in there. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. simple applications. We have some pretty cool, really basic applications that uh, you know you would never necessarily. They're not necessarily classical. We definitely do a lot of industrial, but just really simple things in even retail shops and these kind of things, and really basic logic, and it just fits the bill so perfectly. Yeah, so. yeah absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. So as a so the, the director right now of product uh, marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And what, what does that kind of look like? So, um, so, so yeah, as a director of product marketing, what I do at Phoenix Contact is I lead all of the automation business. So, well, all the automation product business. So that means reporting into me, I have a team of marketing professionals, as well as uh, I have a sales team that reports into me that focuses more on like business development, application development, these kinds of things. And then um, I have some dotted lines to a variety of other uh, salespeople throughout the country. So my footprint is the US. And as the director, I try to really focus on some of the, the bigger picture campaigns, the bigger picture strategies that we're really looking to run. You know, okay, well, what are the big mega trends that we have? Uh, what is our current customer base doing? What is our distribution channel need? And taking all those pieces and putting them together. And then figuring out, okay, we have all these pieces. This is the directions that we can run. These are the the areas of of, of where we can we can 
uh, penetrate the best? Mm -hmm. What uh, what type of strategy could really really apply to uh, to really pull us all together? With the marketing materials, what's the messaging? Uh, what are the applications? What are the resources that we need in terms of personnel or or whatever it may be? So mm -hmm. uh, all these different aspects. What what is your involvement in, in let's say like product development? Where does Where's the kind of like the, the line drawn where from like your marketing side of things of, of saying, seeing like what people are, are liking like through your marketing initiatives versus like the actual product that you, that you put out? Yeah. So it's, it's a really good question. And uh, so at the core, by the way, we are a German, German company. Phoenix Contact is, and I'm part of the U.S. subsidiary. We do have R&D here in the U.S. We also have R&D primarily in Germany, and then we have some in China as well. And uh, there are definitely feedback loops. So I make, or I have made in recent times fewer trips, but um, you know, over the course of my career, many trips to Germany, lots of strategy meetings, and it's really to provide the voice of the customer, the voice of um, our applications and what we need kind of moving forward in different kinds of applications. Mm -hmm. um, so that then gets fed into product management. So I'm in product marketing. Um, so I really take <laughs> and given to me and I craft the messages and I say, I, it's certainly not just me. I have a, a team that, that helps me with all of this. And uh, so we craft the messaging, we get, get the product placed in the market so that it's appropriate. Uh, for the customer, for whoever it is, so that they can properly use it. Because a misapplied product doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help the customer. You know, it just just doesn't it doesn't end up working. So, um, so we we help do that. Now, as we're doing that, we hear different things. Oh, well, I really wish it did this. You know, it does six things. I really wish it did seven things. So then we can take yeah. the that information and provide it back to the development team, the product management team that can work it into um, uh, the strategic development plans. Um, then ultimately we'll get to the engineer so we can get things developed. Sounds like a lot of steps. Frankly, yeah. it is, but we have a lot of parts, 60,000 plus parts, right? So mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of stuff going on. And even in the automation business that I control, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of technologies. Uh, if it goes yeah. inside of a control cabinet, if you're not familiar with Phoenix Contact, we pretty much make it. So terminals, relays, power supplies, cabling, signal conditioning, uh, PLCs, uh, Ethernet switches, industrial mm -hmm. routers, modems, on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. We make pretty much anything that goes inside of industrial control cabinet. So there's a lot of different nuances and products that we get feedback mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I mean, I guess part of my questioning with that is like, as a user of Phoenix contact devices, um, you always find like, and just being innovative as well, you always find like things that Oh, it'd be nice if it had this feature too. Uh, so I think it's really cool to see like how, uh, you know, from a marketing standpoint, how that influences like the product design and the features added to a product and, and just the different product offerings that are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, we love that feedback and, and I, look, we get a lot of it. So I can't say that we can deliver on everything because we can, yeah. Yeah, right. um, but, uh, and it's and never nothing is ever perfect, right? It's always it's it's a matter of does it check enough boxes to be working in the particular application? And that really comes down to how it's marketed, how it's applied, how it's introduced into the market. I mean, mm -hmm. marketing I know can be, especially from an engineering perspective, because look, I'm a degreed engineer. I'm not a degreed marketing guy. Um, I've been playing a marketing guy for the past 17 years, and I guess it's been a good run. Um, but you know. As an engineer, you know, you may think of sales or you may think of marketing and be like, ah, you know, that's it's just trying to get me to buy something or whatever else. And yes, it can be that. But if you're I, in my opinion, if you're doing your job properly um, as a marketeer or as a salesperson, particularly in this industry, yes, you're you're trying to apply the right products for the application. But you're also at the same time trying to collect as much information as possible mm -hmm. from a application, from a customer, from a whatever to figure out how you can help them. Hopefully that's with your products. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, and that's one of the reasons, look, if, if you if you know me, you may know me from Phoenix Contact. I've been here for a long time. I was a wireless guy for five years. I traveled around the country. I was on the road probably 70% of the time in the early year, early days of my career, just looking at all kinds of applications across the country from water, wastewater, to manufacturing and automotive, to oil and gas, and everywhere in between. 
And then I became a manager of different parts of the business and Ethernet infrastructure and then control systems and then ultimately the director of, of all the marketing business. Hmm. And, and through that, you know, you just get to get to experience lots of different things. And that's really made its way into a lot of what we do today. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you think has been like a, a major driver in, the, in your success throughout your career? So I would say the biggest driver of, of the success that I've had in my career is always being inquisitive um, and not being um, just happy with status quo. Um, and I always like to explore. So look, I traveled a lot in my early part of my career. I didn't have to. I really didn't. You know, I could have sat in the quote unquote ivory tower and yeah, I traveled a little bit here and there, but I knew coming out of school, um, I didn't really know that much. I knew the tech, right? I could tell you everything there is. I could probably still recite half of the wireless stuff that I that I knew way back then. But <laughs> until I climbed a water tower, not saying that I ever did that, but hypothetically, if I did, um, or you know, aimed an antenna in you know Wyoming when the winds are blowing at some ungodly rate and it's 10 degrees outside, and you really understand what it is to do a site survey out there, or you know, you're in a in a refinery and you understand, okay, well, there is lots of metal stuff in the way and you actually get those experiences you don't you can't necessarily apply um the same ideas that you would have to, to different types of things without those experiences so being inquisitive it doesn't have to just be getting out there and doing things i think that's a big part of it but you know one of the big things i do now is i'm very involved on linkedin and different communities and committees and a lot of that is to try to to look at where things are going. What are the trends in industry? What are the hot topics? What are the pain points? What are the successful pieces? And trying to pull those in for my own knowledge as well as for the company. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Do you feel that um, there were like any like particular major uh, aspects of your career that kind of was like a shift for you? As far as a, a big shift in my career, so I would say, um, in, in my career, going into management was big, but I would say even before that, you know, going into my career was a big shift because yeah. I'll tell you, when I graduated, I graduated as a double E from Penn State. And uh, I, when I graduated, I loved to code. I loved to code. I enjoy coding mm -hmm. now. And I wanted to uh, sit in a dark room and just write code all all day long and do embedded systems. And then I ended up in marketing in front of everybody and not doing any coding at all. So that was a big shift in my career. Um, and I look back at that and I go, that's, that's awesome because I it's not where I really thought where I would be, but um, finding this position really allowed me to marry sales skills that I had developed through college, mm -hmm. as well as engineering skills that I um, learned during college and apply them to different kinds of applications. And that's what got me my first position as the wireless product specialist. And then as I did that, traveled around and worked with distributors, worked with customers, worked with engineers. And I mean, I, I got started and how old was I? I don't even know, 20, 24, something like that. I'm talking to engineers that are nearing retirement and I'm explaining to them how to put together their wireless communication system across miles of area. And that was um, something I really had to mentally get over because I was the new guy. And yes, I yeah. knew the tech, I knew the application of wireless, but I in no way, shape or form knew their application to the depth that they did or would yeah. or ever, ever could. And, uh, but I tried to stay in my lane. I'm like, and I would ask lots of questions and be respectful of that knowledge and understanding of the sensors and application and apply it. So going from that engineering and marketing mindset there to the management positions that I had was a big jump because all of a sudden I went from being the subject matter expert on a particular narrative, wireless communications, and yeah. really being able to dig in deep on that tech to managing personnel and, and, yeah. and then trying to help other people do the same types of things. And, and then now, and even my position now, I'm not only doing that with other personnel, I'm doing that with other managers and personnel. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just been a, a big change and it's a welcome one. Um, it is different. And um, some of the, the best times I ever had, I'll tell you, were rolling up my sleeves and doing a lot of those antennas and everything else. It was a lot of fun. Um, I've had a lot of fun since then, but it's just different. You know, it's different parts of my career. Yeah. What do you, what do you think has been 
the most helpful for you on the management side of things? So um, the most helpful thing I would say on the management side of things is uh, really just some of the experience, just just getting in and and listening to people. And and um, I, I will say that overall, you know, I believe in not necessarily just dictating things and, and trying to run the whole ship. It, it doesn't doesn't work as well as 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 I would like, right? So w- what I try to do, and and I think my team would say this about me, is um, I try to dialogue with the group to figure out what makes sense. Okay, here's here's the facts. Here's where we are. Here's what we're doing. But what are the thoughts that the team has on how we can approach something or the way we can do things? Because um, yes, I have lots of ideas, and all of my ideas are fantastic. They're not. Some of them are really bad, but I like to say that they're all really good, right? Yeah. But the team, they come up with some fantastic ideas. Mm-hmm. So then you kind of get them all on a board and kind of sort them out and figure out what it is. Lots of brainstorming sessions to figure out how do we want to approach the market. Mm-hmm. It's important to do it within reason, though, because you can dialogue about a topic forever. Eventually, you do have to pick a direction and run. And then you either say, hey, was it successful or not? And guess what? It's okay to fail. Fail, mm-hmm. cut it, pick a new direction, run again. It's okay. Yeah. Um, the important thing is to be open, be dialogued, mm-hmm. and uh, to just keep on trying to things work. And um, we've been pretty successful in the market, particularly in in all the the aspects. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's a big part of our success that in the support of the company to allow us to do this kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. I, one thing I can kind of pick up from you is that, that you definitely have the ability to like be a good listener. So you're you're actually like you know, able to, to listen to the feedbacks of your people. You're able to ask the questions. Well, I think it was one of the big things about like, for me and my success was like, I would listen. There was even a period of time I would ask, I would ask dumb questions. There were questions I actually already knew the answer to, but I asked them to get like a reconfirmation is the knowledge that I know. Correct. Mm-hmm. And, and, and by doing that, the asking of questions and, and the, the just listening to, you know, somebody like this is just being arrogant and thinking that they know a lot, then at that point, you're not asking the questions to then, you know, get responses and validate information that you think, you know, mm-hmm. uh, so like listening, I think has, has been a big uh, success in my career. I think it's something that you're really good at as well. Yeah. I mean, I think listening and then being genuine with your listening mm-hmm. as well, because I mean, and it's, I think we're, we're in a parallel in this, but I, but I mean, of course, you, you'll read that in a lot of management books and these kind of things about listening. But but really being sincere in your listening and and taking in the information and really looking at it and going, yeah, maybe that does make sense. And not just pushing your own agenda throughout the time or, or whatever else. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you feel like has helped helped? Um guide like guide you through through the questioning and asking uh through your management processes what has guided me through it yeah what has helped guide like the team through it like what you know like let's say first you're like trying to work out a problem or, or there's you know some new product that you're looking to market towards like is there anything in particular that you felt like was able to guide the team uh in the direction that you were looking Clear a clear objective of what you're trying to accomplish. So, look, I mean, we have a lot of products. Um, we're a fairly good sized company. Um, mm-hmm. We sell into a lot of different industries, and one product can be used and, and marketed and talked about in many different ways, depending on mm-hmm. where you go with it. Yeah. So, really, kind of narrowing in in how you want to approach things is key. Now, yeah. the big problem with that is. Anytime you narrow, you're by definition excluding certain things Mm. and you have to be comfortable with that. So um, one of the things that I really like to do, whether it's in person on a whiteboard or virtually, um, is whenever we're going to really dig in on a topic is come to a consensus on what our objectives are. So and write them on a board. Okay, we want to. Do take this product to this market to achieve this. Okay, good. It's written mm-hmm. down. 
then you talk, get about 20 minutes in, you're writing down everything. There is no bad ideas, write them out. Okay, then stop. Okay, let's look at it and let's look at the direction that we've walked for the past 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, and say, where are we? And let's figure out by the by these pieces and just look at them and go, okay, are we still in the same direction? So let's look at the objective. This is what we said. One of two things has to change, right? If, if there's a deviation, we either need to change the direction we're walking back to the where we were, where we wrote on the whiteboard, or change what we wrote on the whiteboard to match what's on the um, on our brainstorm. Either one is fine, but they need to match. And mm -hmm. you need to do that periodically throughout the brainstorming process so that ultimately you get to the destination that you think you should be going. Yep. And uh, and that, that's, that's one of the things that uh, I think has helped um, it'd be interesting if my team was on here and they would be like, oh yeah, that's helped or no, that's been terrible. But I really believe sincerely that it has, um, it has helped and guide, guided conversations mm -hmm. in the right direction to, uh, to really get us to some, I think some pretty amazing accomplishments that we've had, um, yeah. throughout our careers. Yeah. Well, maybe you, that you called out there that I think, uh, is really important is that whenever you start to focus in on something, you have to lose other things. And like for us as a company, like that was one thing I kind of really struggled with is we've kind of converted our marketing to be a lot more like the robotic welding side of things. And, you know, for me, I came from more of the material handling side of things. And, and I kind of struggled relieving attention from the material handling side of things. Mm -hmm. So like now a lot more of our marketing initiatives are going towards robotic welding. We're putting more focus into that, right. To have the, the proper customer message so that the, when the customer sees a lead automation, they see, uh, you know, a particular thing. They actually know whenever they see our company, what they're looking at us for versus like they're posting about this or posting about that. They're posting about all these different things. And then they're kind of confused on what we do. What is it exactly this company does? Um, but yeah, like you said, just, you know, having attention to something, but also know that you're going to have to lose attention to other things. Right. And it's okay to have multiple personas and to be different things to different types of people. Um, but it, it is also important to understand the core of the brand and, and where, what that means. And, and it should resonate in some way, shape or form, or it becomes a big challenge. And like, what, what, what is whatever it is with this topic, this, this company, right. whatever it may be. Right. So. <clears throat> So when it comes to like your, your, your product marketing now, like, I guess what level does like you or your team get involved in as far as like, are they like making, making like the marketing material revolved around, uh, you know, the actual product itself features? Like, what does that, what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So what do I do? Right. What does the team do? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, a little bit of an office space, right. What do you say you do here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what we would typically do is take an in information on the product functionality and features of whatever it is. Um, there's also positioning that's already provided from engineering and product management. So then we take this and there's multiple of me in different countries and multiple teams in different countries and relate it to the country because the while a lot of manufacturing and a lot of the industries are common across the world what is important to say a u.s market or a u.s customer may be different than um, a european or an asian customer for yeah. example just take oil and gas for example or any kind of um, process application or, or hazardous location application so we would typically have people that are concerned with like ul and class one div two and these kinds of um, things in the u.s market where in a European market, they may not care about that at all unless they're exporting to the US. They care about ATEX. Um, and then if you go to Asia, it's IECEX. And yes, there are some cross pollinations there, but largely the just the approving bodies are different. So if you write your marketing text and you exclude and you only talk about ATEX or only talk about IECEX or only talk about class one division two, you might be alienating different customer bases because they may not know. Now, I would argue that in a lot of cases, those people would know that those are at least commonalities, but it doesn't matter if the spec calls out a particular thing, you know, in a lot of cases you need to have that on, on the, on the line there. So right. a lot of what we'll do is take in a lot of these product informations, right? And you've used some of our products. Um, some of our products have 
tons of features in them. And it's mm -hmm. narrowing in on going, what are the most important things for this type of application or this type of customer? And then highlighting those. So how do you do that? Okay, well, that goes into the persona, <laughs> what you're doing, all these kind of things. Um, and then we don't actually make the, the collateral. Um, trust me, you do not want me to have Photoshop. I am terrible. Like I can PowerPoint like nobody's business, but you don't want me doing Photoshop. <laughs> it's stick figures and some thumbs up emojis. That's what right. I got. But we then take those concepts and we give them to a communications team. And a communications team is a team of graphics designers and editors and these kinds of things that make us look and sound the way that you see it presented to the market. So, okay. and, and each of these things are really needed. You need the engineers to focus on product feature function, product mm -hmm. management to focus on how does this all wrap up into a product and all connect, marketing to define the strategy messaging and how everything kind of weaves together, and then communications to really make it look good. Yes, people can have all of those traits, but th that's a very unique bunch where you can have the best graphics designer in the world that maybe not know, doesn't know anything at all about our yeah. industry. That's fine. You don't need to know about the industry. You just need to know how to make things look really good yeah. and then have a base understanding of what you're trying to communicate. You get that from marketing. Mm -hmm. And then they get that information of what they're marketing from the product management team that put particular features in there for these reasons because the engineers were working on a specification that was divine by the product mar or management team. So yeah. each of these things are really well needed as you go through the, the different narratives. Yeah. Yeah. I think it also too, is like having the, uh, just the different departmental aspects. Like you mentioned there one, it's like extremely valuable that like, you're like, you know, bringing up and explaining the, the, how the, the, the departments are operating within one another, because it, I think it gives people an insight in like, it's not just marketing. Like there's, so, there's departments inside of, uh, the whole entire process, like multiple departments inside the entire process of, of marketing, and, and from, you know, bringing a product to life that a lot of people wouldn't even think of as like a, a career option. They wouldn't even know that there's multiple options within that one career option. And, uh, you know, I think people being able to see that and I've experienced it as a business owner that, you know, when it comes to like a creative individual, it's nearly impossible to find a creative individual who has industry experience. At least if, you, you know, if you're trying to to hire somebody quickly and you're trying to hire somebody at a, at a reasonable rate, it's a very select few individuals that are, that are doing marketing for, for our industry specifically. So you got to kind of find like the different, um, you know, categories of, of individuals that, okay, you're good at this. How can we relay information to you so that you're able to, you know, create whatever the thing is. So, uh, we can, we can message that to, to, to the customers. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also important to have have a diversified group um, because, you know, while, while it's really good to have all the industry experience and all the industry knowledge, you know, and all these different types of things, particularly I 17 years in a company, right? So you, you get a lot of this. You get the marketing mindset. You get the industry mm -hmm. mindset. You get the product mindset. That's good, but it's also mm -hmm. a rut. So you mm -hmm. got to be careful not to be blind about what's going on outside the rut. Um, and it's it's not a negative thing. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm also a big fan of a diversified group. So if you mm -hmm. look at a number of campaigns that I've run, um, you know, I'll pull people in from the communications team. And because they've done graphics design work for 10 years on, on this stuff, they'll understand, you know, why terminal blocks go on a, on a DIN rail and why you use them to connect wires. But they don't understand everything. But that's OK, because if I can get them to understand my message, the application, these kind of things, then then it's it's arguably a good message, or yeah. at least it's an appropriate message um, for 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 getting the getting it for the ease of communications. So, um, you know, diversity in that group at the early stages is is really nice. And the, and and one other thing is um, the thing that I find really interesting about the industrial industry, largely. I don't think it's necessarily universal, but largely, is that the um, the marketing department in a lot of cases is a more technical group. Because if you look at other industries, um, it is it can be more sales and, and, and less technical, which is 100% fine. But I know my team is not only marketing, but they're also um, like a level three technical support. So that's a pretty technical bunch. 
Um, yeah. You know, if you're, you're talking to a, a product marketing specialist, at least at Phoenix Contact, I know that's true for a lot of industrial companies. I think it's a mm -hmm. little bit of a uniqueness um, compared to marketing in maybe the banking sector or, you know, mm -hmm. some, some other finance or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, big, big brands. Yeah. Retail chains. Yeah. It's definitely very much a lot of like engineers converted to like marketing or engineers converted to sales. You see a lot of that in the, in this industry. Yeah. One other thing that you, that you mentioned that is probably like the number one success for myself when it comes to marketing, uh, as far as uh, getting experiences outside of the industry, you know, my experience was from having a former YouTube channel as a fitness YouTube channel. And, and, it was really driven around like how to grow a YouTube channel. So there was a lot of searching and, 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 and rabbit hole jumping through like how to grow a YouTube channel, how to get more exposure, how to, you know what I mean? And so like through this rabbit hole of questions and of, of trying to like just do something like grab a YouTube or uh, grow a YouTube channel, there's a lot of information in there that is very much like the digital social media landscape that you know i think a lot a lot of uh our industry kind of lacks in the you know ability to to utilize stuff like social media tools and the outside influence played like a major major role in in you know my experiences and knowledges yeah i mean yes there's i i mean i think overall the the the, the industry is getting better but mm -hmm. there there is definitely um largely a gap um a lag i think in the the industrial industry on a lot of things. And a lot of that comes back to who's your customer and how are they consuming information? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot changed with COVID, but you go back a few years and social media was, you know, Facebook and it was for everybody to talk about their puppies and vacations and everything else. So how much business do you do there? Well, there's mm -hmm. a lot of business that happens there, particularly B2C, but how much B2B? Yeah. There's certainly be to be there to some degree, but isn't in our industry. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What is the profile of an engineer if that's your target customer? What is it, mm -hmm. the profile of a buyer? Do they make a decision? You know, all these different things and, and who and what. Now, especially post-COVID, a lot of people are consuming information in all different ways that they didn't mm -hmm. before. And um, yeah, a uh, personal brand is something that I've found very important for a long time, whether it be internal personal brand or external personal brand. Um, it's paramount. It's paramount to, I think, just uh, you as an individual and being successful, but also as a company and being successful in particular areas by people growing strong personal brands in particular niches. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have quite a bit of following yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, I've been pretty active, primarily just on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly how many, um, a little over 9,000 followers or so, and pretty active looking at uh, open automation, IoT, Industry 4.0, uh, these kind of things. And it's it's been a wild ride um, for sure. And it's uh, I've really enjoyed that aspect of really being able to dig in with the community and, and learn mm -hmm. a lot of things as well as provide things. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a huge uh, proponent of LinkedIn. I think it's it's been a, like an amazing tool to like have a, a professional platform and be able to like communicate with people. Like, you know, I, I, I've always been a very serious worker, a very hard worker, mm -hmm. but as far as like professionalism and like going, like having a place to go and be able to talk about career and talk about uh, really just really any career related topic and, and, and be able to communicate with individuals uh, like LinkedIn's really offered that uh, that ability more so than any other platform ever. And I honestly, like, I kind of don't know. I don't know where I would be at, or like, I would definitely feel like there would be a bigger gap in in like my wisdom, maybe because like there's a lot like I can peek in and see what's going on in the industry through like LinkedIn, you know, and and it's just it's it's a huge eye opener. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'll tell you, um, so I got involved early on in LinkedIn. Well, not early on, I guess, um, but a couple of years ago in LinkedIn and really driving driving different things. Um, again, it came down to one of those brainstorming sessions. And one of the things we realized is we didn't have direct access to some of the customers that we wanted to talk to. Well, where were those types of customers? Well, they are online. They're doing different things. They're in discords. They're in Reddit. They're in different places. Well, how do we, how do we go there? 
just go show up and start talking. So yeah. you, and you can't just show up and just start shilling stuff. It doesn't work. You got to develop uh, a, a relationship and have a conversation. So that's what I started with. And what I found was it was absolutely fan, uh, fascinating and fantastic because the big thing is, again, I've been with the company for a long time. I talked about that rut. Like I am very happy in my career. I'm very happy in where I am, very happy with the company, but I do recognize completely that, you know, there is definitely parts of the industry and parts of things I don't know because I've always been in the same spot. So mm -hmm. being able to expand out and a LinkedIn has given me that opportunity. I'm also um, um, a co-founder of the industry 4.0 club. Um, mm -hmm. So I hold um, weekly or bi-weekly podcasts similar to this on industry topics. And I love exploring all different types of topics, things I know about, yep. things I don't know about all over the map to, to get that. And also a, um, a board member of I IoT World to just kind of get an inside scoop of what's going on there and help guide that organization as well. And just trying to get involved in these different organizations to figure out what I don't know and mm -hmm. frankly, what I should be looking at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's like, to be honest, like the, the manufacturing come up is like one of my, one of my like selfish ways of, of gaining more experience, gaining more knowledge. And uh, you know, I'm be, I'm able to sit with like, individuals like you 17 years of experience in this industry and uh, different sectors of industry. It's like just the, the amount of, of knowledge that to be able to capture from somebody like yourself. Uh, yeah, it, it's massive. You know, I, I spend my, I would spend my time watching something like this on my own. Yeah. And, and here I get to sit and have the direct conversation. <laughs> I, I watch it. It's great. You know, I, I was just telling you, I got, got done with the run. So if you see a little bit of red in my face, you know, <laughs> it was a little while ago, but you know, I was listening and then your, your, your live stream came on and I was enjoying that as well. So um, absolutely. It, you learn always, I, I consume so much content on a daily basis. Mm. It's crazy. And, um, and then I try to jot down notes and, and speaking about LinkedIn, you know, one of the things I try to do in LinkedIn is, um, yeah, I gain followers and do all those kind of things. It's actually not really what it's about for me. Um, mm -hmm. For me, it's it's a lot of knowledge share and and confirmation or discussion, because I, I like to pose a position or pose an idea or pose some research that I found, and then have a dialogue about it. And sometimes that works out really well. Other times I get flamed, but whatever, you know, it's a great dialogue of figuring out what you know and you don't know and you learn from it. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a big part of that learning process for me because if I just consume and I don't use it all, I'll lose it. Yeah, I like that. What do you, what do you spend uh, a lot of your time? What type of content do you consume? I, I, it's, it's all over the map. It depends, depends on the flavor of the day. Um, sure. A lot of financial information, um, different different going, things going on in, in, in the various financial sectors. I do a lot with our industry. I look at a lot of um, IoT industry 4.0 things. Um, my kids love gaming, so I, I research gaming and understand yeah. what's going on there. <laughs> um, you know, I enjoy it, but you know, I'm old now, so I think I can only get a little bit of time in before I'm bored again. I don't know why that happens, but mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then trend topics, I would say. So one of the things I've really gotten into just recently, it's very early on, is uh, there's like chat GPT and these kind mm -hmm. of things, but uh, what's actually going on with natural language processing and how mm -hmm. can you really use it? You know, how, how will it affect, okay, the industrial industry, but things as a whole, like how can I do that with my personal knowledge management system that I have, you know, can I expose that in some way so I can make a virtual IRA? Oh my gosh, that's a crazy yeah. idea. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know, just, it's just different things like this. This is yeah. the, the kind of the type of things I like to consume. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. I think that's one, it's a, it might be a, a standard question. I start asking like what content do people consume? Because you know, a lot, I mean, almost every single successful person consumes some level of content, whether, whether it be written or whether it be video or audio. And I'm like a huge consumer of content. I pretty much listen to like zero music. My kids, yeah. when we the car, they say, dad, we play some music. And I'm like, eh, I'll put on, I'll put on this audio book. <laughs> exactly <laughs> um, but uh the, you know the thing it like, so, like one of the things that i do is like i consume a lot of content it's like industry it's uh you know you know business operations it's uh there's a lot of different things from marketing 
kind of d- depends on, on on what I'm doing at the time as well. But but here's one of the big things is like since I love to consume so much content, I do like what what I would call like a content rotation, where like you know maybe I am doing marketing or sales is a big one that I'm focused on right now. Like so I'll watch like hours of like or listen to like hours of like sales content, but then I'll switch and then I'll listen to something completely different industry related topics or just some other type of content, or maybe it's business type of content. Uh, but but the thing is, like, the shift of the content type, like, keeps me interested. Yeah. So it's like I'm never getting bored with, like, the particular type of content that, I, that I'm consuming. So yeah. what, which, what, what cycle are you in right now? Probably still, probably sales. Sales? You know, yep, yep. Still young in the company. You know, I came from being an engineer, project manager to, to – you know, now having to be the sales guy for our company and, and develop that side of things. Um, So are you allowed to go into sales from being an engineer? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, that's one thing that like I've contemplated, like taking on like some type of sales position, or or I just wish I would have had some type of sales position prior to starting a company. So that way I had like some more formal knowledge and, and was able to like, consume some other people's experiences because I'm, I'm very good at like picking up knowledge and being able to be around people for like somewhat short period of time and be able to pick up on the operation of things. Um, mm-hmm. And since I, you know, haven't had that, that uh, traditional experience, there's a lot of things that I'm lacking. And also just being like, there's the the process of sales and then there's the being a salesperson, right? Mm-hmm. Like two, two, two separate things. And, you know, neither one of those really I, I, I had the ability to have formal education on. So there are things that I, now I'm having to educate myself. I'm having to educate myself on sales processes and, and lead flow and, you know, yeah. all these different things. And then on top of that, being a good salesperson uh, right. is a big thing. You know, and, and a big part of it, too, and, and I should have said, you know, I do definitely do a lot of business stuff. Um, and uh, I, I'm a big um, productivity nut as well. So, you know, I mm, try to yeah. research every productivity system that's coming mm-hmm. out and I don't usually switch because I try not to be unproductive other than the yeah. productivity stuff that I listen to. But, <laughs> um, um, but, you know, a big part of that is, you know, I, I don't know where you are with it, but maybe you're not the sales guy, right? Yeah. You hire a sales guy. I don't yeah. know. Maybe you're yeah. better at one of the other many elements that you need for your company, mm-hmm. particularly as it grows. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think the biggest issue now is like just being bootstrapped still. I still consider yeah. us bootstrapped, right? We've grown to a point where like where we need the level of engineers that we have. We need the level of marketing people, like all the things to sustain what we got. Um, I, You know, the way I kind of look at our company now, we're like basically in a, in a phase where like if we, if we win a couple of the right projects back to back, now we can make that investment to, to do like, you know, bringing in like a sales individual full time to, um, just manage our, our sales thing. Uh, right. And, and right now we, we have somebody on our team who's, who's got some sales experience, like 10 years of experience. Who's, uh, you know, recently came over to the sales side of our company and that that's been a major help and just being able to watch how they're able to, to coordinate and, uh, you know, same thing with like the operation side of things. I come from more of the operation side with like being a, a programmer and being a project manager, but bringing on somebody who like had a, um, a good corporate level experience into our company. That's, that's helped out a lot. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of bringing in experienced individuals because I love being able to learn from individuals and, and know that, you know, I don't do everything in, in, in the best way. And there's always things to learn. Sorry, my dog brought in a squeaky toy. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, I think it's making it through on the mic. So, um, so we'll just throw that over there. He'll bring it back in 30 seconds. So this is the way the rest of the conversation will go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess if you wouldn't mind, like, is there, is there any particular thing that you would, that's, do you think would be valuable to the individuals listening to, to this podcast here? Don't have squeaky toys around. You're You're doing a conversation. Um, so you know, the, the big thing that I would like to say is this is manufacturing come up, right? And yeah. one of the things that I was really interested in doing this podcast is is this, is, you know, coming out of school as an engineer, I had the mindset of, okay, I got to go do development work. I'm an engineer. And while I think that's true for a lot of people, 
you know, there are opportunities outside of doing just engineering. Mm -hmm. And one of those opportunities is doing things like sales, doing things mm -hmm. like marketing, because particularly in this industry, you know, having that technical background can be hugely beneficial to the sales process, to the marketing mm -hmm. process. And, and, you know, just because you go into one of those types of uh, fields, marketing or sales or these kind mm -hmm. of things, it doesn't mean you're not going to use your engineering skills. Because I can tell you, I designed a lot of wireless systems. I designed a lot of networks over my years. And, um, you know, some, some, um, you know, not some, a lot of them I'm extremely proud of. No different than an engineer in designing a system or a control cabinet or whatever else. So mm -hmm. there are other opportunities, particularly if you have a propensity to want to talk to come, uh, other people and and yeah. have conversations and i think it's inherent for a lot of engineers to to want to learn but to go outside of just that tech zone and and really expand into the other areas it's yeah. it's huge so yeah. don't shy away from it you know embrace yeah. it and i i think if you do do those kind of things it can only help you ongoing you even said it yourself right you were in engineering and hey you wish you had a little bit of sales experience i think sales experience is one of those things that you know, it's it's something that if you've done it at some point in time, nobody looks back at it and was like, ah, oh, I was terrible as a sales guy. Like, it, it's good experience because you get yeah. a diversity of different types of conversations and different types of uh, um, rejections and yeah. and conversations um, that you wouldn't otherwise get. So yeah. that's what I would say is uh, there is more than just engineering. And yeah. <laughs> trust me, there's lots of engineers that are needed out there. I'm just saying, hey, there is opportunities outside of that. I think marketing is a great one, particularly as a product specialist, as well as uh <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, like when it comes to like manufacturing, there's a whole like gamut. There's the whole business side of things that need to be operated, HR, all these different departments that I think a lot of time are, are, are kind of like not even really thought about, especially early on stages of, uh, you know, your college or, or just early stages of your career. And, uh, yeah, there's a ton of opportunities out there uh, for those different positions. Also, uh, if uh, one of the big things that I struggle with, and that I, if you're gonna try, to, if you're gonna do sales, is is a, objections. That's like that's the biggest one that I that I uh, I struggle with, and it's because I'm so like because I came from being so technical that I'm like, you know, they're like, well, how do you know the robot's not gonna crash? And it's like, well, I know there's like DCS and there's these things, or you know what I mean? And like, and, but they're just like, okay, but how do you know? <laughs> and it's like so like just going through like the, those type of objections like where you're so technical you're just like you know in your mind it's not a certain way but it's like hard to to, to demonstrate that to a, to a customer so like that's been like the biggest one that, that i agree it's i'm not wrong you're wrong you're, you're wrong <laughs> but you can't say that like that might be what you mentally that's the conversation but outside is i understand your concern you know here are the things that we could do about that like that would be the better way to approach that you know <laughs> yeah yeah right. Absolutely. Well, Ira, where can people find you at? So um, you can find me at Phoenix Contact. Um, you know, you, you know, uh, you can reach out to me there. But probably the easiest way for this audience to reach out to me would be via LinkedIn. Um, you can search me up. There's not uh, too many Ira Sharps out there. I'm Ira Sharp Jr. Um, so uh, you can find me on there. Typically talking about open automation, uh, Industry 4.0, IoT. Um, and, uh, yeah, um, uh, happy to talk to you about anything and any of those topics, Phoenix contact related, or you know, I've actually helped quite a few people in different types of career activities as well, trying to find different positions and these kind of things. So, you know, for free to help out in any way that I can message me and I'll let you know if I can. So awesome. Thank you for being with us today and, uh, sharing your valuable experience. Yeah, Malachi. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. I really do appreciate it.